Welcome to Transitioning Medicare Part 1. Um, this is being put on through the Carroll County Library System, and we're glad to have you join us. I am representing the SHIP Health, uh, SHIP, which is the State Health Insurance Assistance Program. My name is Lois Romeo, and on the line with me as well, and, and setting up the recording is Hannah Bader from the library. SHIP is the local help with Medicare. It, we do not have any kind of bias. We have no costs. We're not trying to sell you anything. It's all confidential. We are all trained counselors. Um, we can do everything from this type of education to one-on-one -on -one counseling. That would be by appointment. We can look at your benefit program review, whether that's a Medicare review or if you're trying to compare that to a retirement review of your benefits, we can help you understand how they, how they match or don't match. We also can help you with application assistance for financial assistance as well as problem resolution. This is something that is available to all Carroll County residents and there are counterparts to us across the nation. If you have friends in Maryland who uh, are in other counties and would like to know how to get this kind of assistance, this gives you their phone numbers, just so you have it handy. People tend to think of Medicare as health insurance for people over 65. That's true, but it's also for people under 65 with certain disabilities and at any age if they have end-stage renal disease. It was originally set up in 1965, and in 2023, there were 66 million people are on Medicare. And that's projected to grow to 80 million by 2030. As you know, we're an aging population. 10,000 people every day sign into Medicare, enroll into Medicare. So that's why it gets very, very busy. In 2006, they added the prescription drug benefit. So that was included much later than the original Medicare. How would you go about enrolling in Medicare? You would enroll through either the Social Security Administration or the Railroad Retirement Board, if you, that's where you retired from. So enrollment for Medicare is through those, whereas the administration of Medicare is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You'll see that abbreviation as CMS. Your enrollment can be automatic. If you're already receiving a Social Security check or a railroad benefit check, for retirement, then enrollment in Medicare is automatic. You will get that initial enrollment package in the mail. It's gonna be mailed about three months before you turn 65 or on the 25th month of disability benefits if you have disability through Social Security. That package does include your Medicare card. So while you'll start getting lots of ads that make try to make it look like it's Medicare, and you can toss a lot of them. Before you toss them, just open it, please, and make sure that it doesn't contain your Medicare card. If you're not yet receiving Social Security benefits, then you may need to proactively enroll in Medicare. And you can do that one of several ways. You can go online to ssa.gov. You can do it at your local Social Security office in Westminster. You will need to call for an appointment. You can do it over the phone via the national SSA number, which we've included here. And we've given you the hours. Um, wait times to speak can be pretty long, but they're typically shorter early in the day or later in the afternoon. Um, they're also less busy later in the week, Wednesday through fi Friday and later in the month. If you're a retired railroad worker, then enroll through RRB and we've put the number here for your local office. So when do you want to go about enrolling in Medicare? You'll hear this term initial enrollment period multiple times in the presentation. That initial enrollment period lasts seven months. It starts from three months before the month you turn 65 through three months after that you turn 65. The coverage, if you do your enrollment up through the first three months before the month you turn 65, then your coverage is gonna start on the first day of your birthday month. Not on your birthday, but on the first day. If you 
enroll later, you're going to see it's going to begin the first of the month following the month you enrolled. You can enroll at some other periods if you're still actively working, and we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. But just make sure you know the rules, because if you delay and you needed to sign up at the initial enrollment period, you would pay a penalty. So let's talk about the parts of Medicare. Part A is your hospital insurance. That is actually being admitted to the hospital. So it's while you're in the hospital itself, it would apply to a skilled nursing facility such as a rehab center. Certain home health care falls under Part A and hospice care falls under Part A. Part B is, you can think of it as all other medical insurance except prescription. So the one you'll deal with the most often if you have original Medicare is Part B. That's gonna be your doctors, your labs, outpatient, emergency services, kidney dialysis, mental health, durable medical equipment, chemo, all of that and it's going to fall under Part B medical insurance. Part D is going to be your Medicare prescription drug coverage. And just so you don't think we don't know our alphabet, the reason we put Part C after A, B, and D is under original Medicare, you would have A, B, and D. Part C is actually a Medicare Advantage plan, and that is actually an alternative way of receiving your Medicare. It will include, at a minimum, Part A and B, and most of them include Part D coverage as well. So if you, if you don't have one of these books yet, you will get one sent to you as you sign up for Medicare, or you can stop by our office, or you can order it online. But this is sort of your, your Bible, so to speak, for Medicare and you. It's going to tell you all you need to know and everything we talk about in one way or another is in this book. If you look at pages 30 through 56 in, in this year's book, it will give you what, it, what the complete list of covered services are. So if you look for that blue apple in there, you're gonna see what preventative services are covered. And those are covered at no cost, there's no copay. And that's from, from doctors who accept Medicare assignment. And that's because they want you to get the preventative services to keep you healthy. So, you can be on the left-hand side of this chart or you can be on the right-hand side of this chart. At a very high level, original Medicare, you're going to have part A, B, and D. And you can go to any doctor, any facility that accepts Medicare patients, which is almost all of them. You may decide to pick up a Medicare supplement insurance or Medigap as a secondary to pick up additional financial payments. That's the left-hand side of this chart. On the right-hand side of this chart, you have you would pick a Medicare Advantage plan. That would be an HMO or PPO. That would be a network of doctors. If you pick an HMO and go outside that network, you have no coverage. You pay all the costs. If you pick a PPO, you can go outside that network but you'll pay more than if you stay inside the network. It would include your Part A, B, and usually Part D. The only time you wouldn't pick up a Part D plan with one of these would be if you have alternative prescription drug coverage that's comparable, such as uh, VA benefits, that type of thing. The other thing that's different is on the right-hand side of the chart, there are some benefits you can't get under original Medicare. So coverage for uh, vision, dental, and hearing. So on the left-hand side, if some of those are medically necessary, such as cataract surgery, you would get coverage. But if you just wanna have your eyes examined to be able to get a pair of glasses, that's not covered under original Medicare. So, First decision you get to make is, um, should you keep or sign up for Part A? Uh, many people do, and the reason they do, even if they still are actively employed, and that's because it's premium free for most people. If you or your spouse have worked for at least 40 quarters and paid into FICA, 
you do not pay a premium for Part A. So you would contact Social Security to sign up. Again, you can do that online. You would not want to sign up for Part A if you have, or you may not want to, if you have a health savings account. You're not allowed to continue to contribute to an HSA tax-free once you've enrolled in Medicare. So you can use the contributions you've already made there, but you may not, again, tax-free, continue to contribute to it. Part B um, is a little more of a decision for most people. So some pe many people will delay Part B if they have coverage through either their active employment, either yours or your spouse's. One of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do though is check with your HR department to find out how your current coverage works with Medicare. They may require you or your spouse at 65 to enroll in Part A and B to continue to have coverage. Other times you can enroll, there's no penalty if you enroll within eight months of losing coverage through active employment. If you don't have medical coverage through active employment, then you, most people will go ahead and enroll. The people that will have a little more decision-making there would be um, retired federal employees. They, they need to do a little further um, assessment because they're not required to take Part B. Just remember that delaying Part B can result in higher premiums and or paying for your health care out of pocket. So coverage based on current employment does not include the following. So COBRA retirement coverage, VA coverage, individual health coverage like the health insurance marketplace are not considered current employment insurance. If you delay your Medicare coverage for any of those reasons and you didn't enroll within the allotted time frame, then you will normally be charged a penalty. So how does your insurance work with, with Medicare? If you have retiree insurance, then Medicare is going to pay first and your retiree is secondary. If you're 65 or older, but are still have a group health plan based on current employment, if that employer has less, um, 20 employees or more, then your group health plan will pay first and Medicare is secondary. If they have less than 20 employees, then Medicare is going to pay first and your group health plan becomes secondary. If you're under 65 and have a disability, then those numbers change for the employees. If you still, you or your spouse have current employee employment and the employee has a hundred or more employees, then your group health plan pays first, Medicare is secondary. If they have fewer than a hundred employees, then Medicare will pay first and your group health insurance becomes secondary. If you have your current group health insurance based on current employment, um, and you're eligible for Medicare because of end-stage renal disease, there are special rules. Your group health plan will pay for the first 30 months after you become eligible to enroll in Medicare. Medicare, Medicare will pay first after that 30-month period. So it flips at the 30 months. If you have Medicaid, Medicare always pays first. Medicaid is the insurance of last resort, essentially. So this is where you can make some decisions about signing up for Part B. You must have Part B if you want to buy a Medigap or a Medicare Advantage plan. You have to have both Part A and B. If you're eligible for TRICARE, you're required to have that as well. If your employer coverage requires you, then you need to do that. If you only use veterans health care benefits, you may not want to sign up for Part B. Um, what we see some veterans do is sign up for um, Part A and B and then do some of their drug coverage through veterans because veterans either will be less expensive in some cases or they will um, cover sometimes drugs that are not covered under Medicare. 
So again, if you sign up late um, after you no longer have that active employer coverage, then you could pay a penalty. So what are those areas of when you should be enrolling? During the seven month initial enrollment period, that three months prior to the month you turn 65 through the three months after you turn 65, you can do it within eight months of retiring from active employment. Again, that's yours or your spouse's. If you don't sign up in one of those two periods, then you would sign up during what they call general enrollment. And that is the first quarter of each year. So January 1st through March 31st, and it begins on the first of the month following enrollment. You would then have a late penalty of 10% of the premium for every 12 months you were eligible for Part B that you did not sign up. So if you automatically get that card in the mail because you're already taking Social Security or railroad benefits, then you want to keep it and accept Part A and B if you want that. If not, what you need to do is follow the instructions that come with the card, but you're going to return it and refuse Part B. And the reason you might refuse Part B is because as soon as you have Part B, you're going to start paying for it every month out of your, out of your Social Security. And that may be a lot of duplication with your active employment insurance. It also affects your ability to have some guaranteed issue rights for buying a Medigap. So what'll happen if you do that is they're gonna send you a new card and instead of showing part A coverage and part B coverage, it's just gonna show part A on it. So let's talk about what happens when you have original Medicare. So this, this gives you a view of the co-pays and deductibles. So you'll notice again that for Part A hospital, inpatient hospital and rehab kind of centers, that again, you're not going to pay a premium for most people. However, if you get admitted to the hospital, you will be responsible for $1,632 if you have no secondary insurance. After you've done that, you will have 60 days of hospital coverage. And if you need more than that in a benefit period, you'll see you're going to start paying some coinsurances per day. If you needed 91 through 150 days in that same benefit period, it gets even heftier, $816 a day. You are then working on something called your 60 lifetime reserve days. You might use 10 this year and maybe none for another 10 years, but when you've used your 60 lifetime reserve days, they're done, you have no more. And you would be responsible for all costs after the 150th day. If you've been admitted to the hospital for at least three full days and then had to go to a rehab center, then the first 20 days you have no coinsurance. And then after that, again, you start paying a coinsurance per day for up to the next 80 days. This all applies to a benefit period. The benefit period is defined by when you last got out of either the hospital or the skilled nursing facility. If more than 60 calendar days, not your 60 hospital days up above, but if more than 60 calendar days have gone by since you got out of there and you go back into admission at the hospital, then you are in a new benefit period. When you go into a new benefit period, you are again responsible for the 1632 and you start your day count all over again. So just to make this really clear, a um, couple things. First off, you can have more than one benefit period in a calendar year. If you went in, and I hope you never do this, but if you went in for 10 days in January and came out, did the same thing in February, March, April, May, you're still in the same benefit period and you are working on those 60 hospital days you had. However, if you went in for Jan in January for 10 days and came right back out and didn't go back into until May, 
more than 60 calendar days have gone by. Doesn't matter that you've only used 10 of those hospital days. You enter into a new benefit period and owe the 1632 again and start your day count again. That is part A, hospital insurance. Part B again is your medical insurance. Again, does not cover prescriptions, but it covers pretty much all else medical. So doctors, labs, x-rays, cancer treatments, dialysis, um, any kind of durable medical equipment, outpatient surgeries, emergency room, all of that falls under part B. So if you are now taking social security, 174.70 per month, which is your part B premium, will start being taken out of your social security check before you ever see it. That can be income adjusted upward, depending on what you make. And I'll show you a table at the end that shows you what that could be income adjusted to. If you're not yet taking social security, you will get billed for this. Unless you proactively go in to have it billed monthly, it will get billed quarterly at three times the 174.70. When you first go to doctors and labs in the year, the first $240 in that year, you will be responsible for. That's your Part B deductible. After that, and this is the part again, most people are more familiar with, Medicare pays 80% of, of the bill of their rate and you would be responsible for 20%. Unless you go to a doctor or facility that does not accept assignment, then they can charge up to 15% above the Medicare rate. So a Medicare bill might be from the doctor $200. And the Medicare rate might only be 100. Medicare would pay 80 of that after your initial deductible. Medicare would pay 80 of that and you'd be responsible for 20 of that. Again, unless you go to someone who did not agree to the rate that Medicare has, they could then charge you up to $15 more on that particular situation. But you are not responsible for the difference between the $200 bill and the Medicare rate of $100. Other than if you go to the don't accept assignment and then you're responsible for that other 15%. So those deductibles and coinsurances are what drive people to decide they might want to add a supplemental coverage if they don't already have things like a retiree secondary. So that's where you would look at a Medicare supplement insurance or Medigap. So what is a Medigap? They are insurance policies. They're sold by private companies. Again, it supplements your original Medicare. It's a financial vehicle. It's designed to cover part A and B deductibles and or coinsurances. It does not give you additional services. It only kicks in if Medicare covers something this would apply towards the deductible and coinsurance. They are standardized plans. I'm going to show you those in a minute, but every company that offers you a particular letter plan has to cover exactly the same fees. Their pricing will be all different and what you pay for your insurance will be different, but they have to cover the same things. So determining whether you need a Medigap, you can figure that out by uh, based on a couple of things. Do you already have a secondary? You might have one as a retiree plan or TRICARE or Veterans Health Benefits. If so, then you might not need a Medigap and very probably won't need a Medigap. Um, the other question to look at is, can you afford the Medicare deductibles and co-payments? So would you rather pay an insurance company you know, monthly to cover those things, or you're going to look at it from a viewpoint of, well, I'll pay them as they come along. So these are the Medigap plan types that are available in 2024. To read this chart, if you look down the left-hand side of this chart, these are the deductibles and coinsurances you saw on the earlier chart. You could pick any one of the letters that go across the top. I'm going to talk to two of them. 
just because they're the most commonly chosen. I will make a note first though, if you are under 65 um, disabled, then you may only pick a plan A or plan D. Once you turn 65 though, you get the chance to pick any one of these. So if you pick a plan G, you'll see that there is an X in every row except the part B deductible, the original $240 you pay for doctors and labs in the year. You'll notice as you go across that entire row, nobody pays that. None of the policies you can buy today, unless you were born before 1-1-2020, I'm sorry, unless you were 65 before 1-1-2020, then you cannot pick a plan that covers that. So if you pick a G, that is going to be your most expensive policy, but it's also going to cover everything but that original 240. A plan N, well, again, that's another commonly chosen one, is going to be less premium, but it also will not pay the 240. You'll notice the footnote below it will, you will pay a copay when you go to the doctors of up to $20 and up to 50 for emergency room visit if you do not get admitted to the emergency room. A plan G high deductible is becoming more popular. Again, look at the footnote below. Many people think of a G high deductible as a catastrophic coverage meaning they're going to have their original Medicare coverage, but they will pay all of the co-insurances and deductibles up to the first $2,800. And then after that, they look just like a G. Everything else will be covered. So the, the premiums are significantly lower, especially as you age. Um, but, you know, you're, it's assuming you're healthy most years. So if you go in with a whole lot of health issues, you know, that may be a bad choice for you. On the other hand, if you have assets to the side, um, like a 401k, you might say that's an ideal plan for you. So all of these will, you know, the right plan for different people is different. There was a new rule that went into place in July of last year. So it gave you, it's called the birth, we call it the birthday rule anyway. It used to be when you picked a plan, a Medigap, you had to be very, very careful up front. You still should consider it very carefully. But the difference is, whereas before, if you applied later, they could do medical unwriting and did not have to give you a policy. Now, every year on your birthday, starting on the day of your birthday, if for 30 days, if you already have a Medigap, you may pick another Medigap without going through medical underwriting and they have to give you that policy. So you could shop with your own company or other companies, which will make these companies competitive on the outer years. You may only pick a plan that gives you equal to or lesser coverage than you have today. So this chart is just letting you know, if you picked a plan G, for instance, <laughs> excuse me, you could pick any one of the plans you see to the right. Whereas if you pick a G high deductible, you would have to pick a different G high deductible. So how do you find the right Medigap policy for you? You can go out to medicare.gov or you can go to the Maryland insurance site because that's who reviews these companies. They are offered, anybody in Maryland can buy from the same companies. I would advise you if you go out to the site to go to the Maryland insurance because they have the prices. So Medicare.gov for Medigap, you can see what's available to you, but if you wanna see the prices, you need to go out to the Maryland insurance site, or you can get one of the books that we have available. We print that out for you.
we're going to talk more about the guaranteed issue right period um, next week. So when, when you see part two of this presentation, you're going to, we'll be just spending our whole time on Medigap versus Medicare Advantage plan. And we will spend time talking about guaranteed issue rights. So next thing would be deciding um, about adding drug coverage. For most people, you would need to add drug coverage if you don't want to pay a penalty down the line. So part D, your Medicare prescription drug coverage. You have to have part A and or B, either one, to be able to pick up a prescription drug coverage. This you do have to actively enroll yourself. You don't, nobody's gonna enroll you automatically on this. You can delay that enrollment with no penalty if you have creditable drug coverage. So that just means that that drug coverage is equal to or better than what you would get with Medicare. And you are, the drug companies are required to send you every year after you turn 65 to inform you if your drug coverage is credible or not. Hold on to that just in case you need that proof down the line. You do have creditable prescription drug coverage if you have employer or union health coverage, COBRA, Medicaid, FEHB, Veterans, CHAMP VA, TRICARE, and Indian Health Services. Again, keep that information um, just in case you need it later. So when can you enroll in Part D? You can enroll in Part D during your seven month initial enrollment period, the three months for, before through the three months after your um, birth month of turning 65 or going 25th month of disability. You can look at it every year during open enrollment and we recommend that you do, uh, which is October 15th through December 7th each year. When you sign up during open enrollment, the coverage will start January 1st of the following year. There are some other times you can join, such as within 60, 30 days of losing employer or retiree creditable coverage. Otherwise, there is a late en enrollment period. Um, and that is, you know, for each month that you didn't have Part D when you were eligible, you're going to pay 1% of the base rate. And so, you know, that may not sound like a lot, but you're going to pay it the rest of your life. And if you wait for quite a while, it can add up pretty significantly. When you, whenever you apply for Medicare Part D, except during open enrollment, your coverage will start the first of the following month. So what are you going to pay for your Part D prescription drug plan? You're going to pay, pay a monthly premium, a possibly a yearly deductible because it can be anywhere from zero to $545. And you're going to pay some kind of copay um, or co-insurance for drugs on the plan's formulary. Again, your plan premium on, on prescription drug plan can be income adjusted upward. And this is also where your penalty, if applicable, would be applied. So, the nice part on the prescription drug plan is you or we can set up for you a Medicare.gov site where you can use a very useful tool to compare if you would put in your drugs and where you would pick up your prescriptions and it will actually do the calculations for you to tell you what your drugs would cost across the year. And it would also prioritize for you, taking all of these elements into play, what would be your lowest cost for the year. The biggest thing people do wrong sometimes is they go, I want the lowest premium, or I want the lowest deductible, or I want the lowest drug cost. You want the lowest overall cost, and that's what this system will put together for you. You may have heard of the donut hole. So, um, there are a couple phases you can go through, deductible, deductible and or initial coverage um, phase. That's where you would pay the plans assigned co-pays. Once you've gotten up to retail drug costs, which is more than what you've paid out, 
of $5,030 this year, you would fall into something called the coverage gap. When you're in the coverage ga gap, you are gonna pay 25% of the retail cost of all meds until you hit another element called your true out of pocket cost for the year. When that equals 8,000, then you go into something called catastrophic coverage. Your prescriptions are now covered at 100% at that point. So your costs would not be anything. And we have the description below of all the things that go into the true out of pocket cost. So what are some of the things that you wanna consider when you're looking at the best plan for you? Preferred pharmacies, different pharmacies have negotiated different pricing with the drug manufacturers. So is it a preferred pharmacy? Are your drugs on the formulary? Does that plan require you to do pre-authorization from your doctor? Which isn't a big deal usually. Um, the doctor just contacts them. Or they might require you to do step therapy. They might require you to do a generic before they, you know, you can qualify for them to pay for the plan. I'm sorry, for the brand. So this is the system I was talking about. It's out on medicare.gov. You can go out to the plan finder. You can call the plan directly. You can call Central Medicare and they will help you do this. Or you can contact us and we will help you with it. I would highly recommend, you know, uh, not trying to call the plan directly because number one, it's hard to get through to them. Secondly, you don't even know what the plans are and you don't want to call 20 some plans. You, you want the system to do the work for you. So much better you get, you know, get it one of the ways that you're using the plan finder. So um, what is open enrollment? October 15th through December 7th. Your plans change every year. Your prescriptions can change every year. So two things we suggest you review every year, October 15th through December 7th, and that's your Part D prescription drug plan. And if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, that runs on an annual basis. So on both of those, during open enrollment, either on your own or you can contact us or Central Medicare, we can help you look at the options and see whether you want to change any of those. If you change during open enrollment, the new plans become effective January 1. So we're going to flip from the left-hand side of this chart to the right-hand side of this chart. So if you join a Medicare Advantage plan, you will be disenrolled from your Part D. So the other thing to be aware of is if you were to enroll in a Part D, it's going to disenroll you from a Medicare Advantage plan. So you just make sure you have your prescription drug coverage. That if you're switching to an Advantage plan, that you pick one that has that drug coverage. The other thing to be aware is you may not be sold a Medigap if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. You can only be sold that as a secondary to original Medicare. Again, Medicare Advantage plan, HMO or PPO, and it's going to combine A, B, and in most cases, D. So if you join a Medicare, if you want to join a Medicare Advantage plan, a couple things are true. Again, you have to have Part A and B to join. You still do pay your Part B premium, plus in many cases, a monthly plan premium for that insurance. They may, and in most cases, require you to use a network or obtain a referral to see a specialist. Um, Copay and coinsurance may apply. They may include, and different ones, you can look this up on the system, will cover it in different amounts, dental vision and hearing aids. And again, remember, if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, you can't be in a Part D prescription drug plan and you may not be sold a Medigap. So these are the Medicare Advantage plans for 2024. The ones above the line, uh, anyone may join. The ones below the line, you have to be uh, on medical assistance, Medicaid level type income to join any of the ones below the line. Those are considered special needs Advantage plans.
again, these we'll talk about next week, but this just gives you the array of choices you have. You'll notice there's only two companies that offer PPOs, and that's um, Johns Hopkins and Humana. So when can you enroll in an Advantage plan? You can do that during your seven, seven month initial enrollment period again, three months before your month you turn 65 or your 25th month if you're disabled and three months after that month. So you can do it during the year, yearly open enrollment period. In that situation, again, coverage begins January 1. There are some other situations where you may have a special enrollment period. Special enrollment period in that situation would again be things such as you've just lost employer or retiree uh, coverage for insurance, that type of thing. This is a chart that gives you a view across the original Medicare versus a Medicare Advantage. Um, these I usually suggest people read, take a look at it, and decide you know, what questions they have, and then we can always do follow-on questions. This is, a this is what you would see if you go out and sign up for Medicare.gov. Uh, if you go out to their website, it's going to say, Welcome to Medicare. Get started. If you are brand new, you won't be able to set up your, you can go look there anytime, but you won't be able to set up your own personal My Medicare account where it says create account in the left hand bottom until you actually have your Medicare number. But it's a really good place to look at information. It's really a good place to, if you want, get your electronic statements versus getting all that paperwork sent to you, you can use the tools out there. So it's a really worthwhile um, account for you to set up. And again, if you come to see us, we'll help you set it up, but it's pretty easy. So these are the kinds of things you can go out there. You can see where you stand on your yearly deductibles. You can see, you know, that it shows the health and prescription drug enrollment information that you know you have what you want. You can look at your entitlement and preventive services. You can actually, like I said, view your Medicare claims and Medicare summary notices. That can be extremely helpful if you're trying to do a review. So let's talk about whether you qualify for any kind of a Medicare savings program. So the Medicare savings programs are financial assistance type programs. The first three are, if you're going down the left-hand column, the first three are federal programs. So you will see they have both an individual um, or married, whichever, income limit and an asset test. So if you qualify for Quimby, and if you're married and you both you would both qualify for Quimby or not, right? Um, then that's gonna pay your part A, part B premiums and deductibles and part B coinsurance, which is the 20%. You can have a bit more income, same asset tests, and be a slimby. That is only going to pay the Part B premium. That's that one seventy four seventy a month that comes out of your Social Security. If you qualify for Quimby or Slimby, then you automatically qualify for Social Security extra help. So Quimby and Slimby are designed to help around the medical side. Extra help is designed to help around the drug side. You'll see you could have a higher income and higher assets. It's going to help you with prescription premiums, deductibles, and co-pays. You'll pay less. It also allows you to change your prescription plan quarterly if you wanted to. The fourth one is actually a state program. As you can see, the income limit is significantly higher um, than it is for the others. And there is no asset test. So we have quite a few people that are on the Senior Prescription Drug Assistance Program, what you'll hear us refer to as SPEDAP. 
That's going to pay for each of you, if you're a married couple, up to $75 per month of your Part D premium. So if your premium is 30, it's going to pay that. If it's 75, it's going to pay that. It also allows you to change once during your plan time, um, you know, outside of open enrollment. So if you were to be prescribed all of a sudden a drug that's not on your formulary, that can be a big plus for people. So again, these are your financial assistance programs. We're going to switch now to SMB, which is Senior Medicare Patrol. Uh, it's estimated that Medicare loses $60 million a year to fraud, errors, and abuse. And the SMP program is really set up to try to detect, prevent, and report Medicare fraud. So number one, protect yourself from Medicare fraud and abuse. You can do that a number of different ways. Um, treat your Medicare card like you would a credit card. There are very few people you should be giving that number out to. It'll be your medical providers. If you call Central Medicare, you would give that to them. If you come to see us, we needed to be able to look at your information. Watch out for identity theft. Um, so, you know, don't leave it laying around. Keep it where you know where it is. Be aware Medicare is not going to call you. When you get that 30th call, which especially during open enrollment can happen a lot, or right as you turn 65 for that matter, um, you're going to get a whole lot of calls. It is not going to be Medicare calling you. It's going to be a broker or someone else trying to sell you Medicare. Medicare will not call you or visit your home. And if someone is telling you they are, you should just hang up on them. Don't talk to them because it's fraud. The second thing that we need folks to do is to really read their Medicare summary notices. That is the statement that's going to show everything that's been paid for on your behalf by Medicare. So we want you to check for a couple things. Look to see if there are services you did not receive. Look to see if you see double billing or services not ordered by your doctor. So one of the things we saw during COVID, the two very common ones that might show up out there, um, during COVID, we saw a whole lot of COVID tests being sent that really weren't being sent to people. Um, and they weren't receiving anything and yet Medicare was being billed. And another one is durable medical equipment. All of a sudden, you know, a wheelchair shows up at your door and it's not something you ordered. Anything like that, you know, that you did not get you should be contacting either Central Medicare or ourselves to help with that. The other thing that you do want to do, though, if you see something that you didn't receive, but let's say it shows your provider's name on there, what you might do is check first with the provider because it could just be a typing error. So that would be your first step is check with the provider if something doesn't look right. And if, it, if not, if that looks okay, um, then gather information in your documentation and you can contact us at SHIP or you can contact, because we're SHIP slash SMP or Central Medicare. And we can help you figure out, you know, what needs to happen to have this investigated as fraud. It is free and confidential. So again, we represent the SHIP and SMP, so State Health Insurance Assistance Program and the Senior Medicare Patrol. Kristen Harvey is the one full-time employee in the Carroll County government that works with this. That's her phone number. She sets up all, and her email address, she sets up all of the appointments for the rest of us, as well as herself. The rest of us are all volunteers. We have to be trained and we have to take testing on our training. So we're here to help you. Again, we're unbiased. We are not trying to sell you anything. We just want you to have legitimate information to make the best choices for you that you can make. I said earlier in the program that um, I would show you the income-related Medicare adjustment amounts. 
So depending on how you file your taxes, you'll see the categories. So for instance, let's say you're married with um, joint tax return. If you make under 206,000, no, this is gross income. Uh, if you make under that for the year, everything combined, then you're gonna pay your plan premium for part D, this is prescription drug right now. If you make more than that, you'll see as you go up in amounts that you could pay up to $81 more than whatever your plan premium is monthly, <laughs> Again, depending on what you make. Part B, you can read the table the same way. By the way, this is these are based on your yearly income two years prior. So if something has dramatically changed, like you retired, you're going to want to probably appeal to Social Security as to why you should not be paying as much, you know, if you had a major drop in your income. So again, over here for Part B premium, this shows you, depending on what you make and how you file your taxes, what that amount above the 174.70 a month you could be paying. And um, that is really it. This is just a chance to ask questions, which obviously you can't do if you're listening to just a recording. But when we give this on the webinar, you're allowed to ask questions. We also appreciate your, that you're attending today, you know, that you're watching this. So, We'd love to have you give us some feedback. Um, tell us what we can do better, what what whether you're, it's helpful, et cetera. And you just have to scan the QR code or the link below to be able to do that. Um, you can make sure you take note of presenter's name. My name is Lois Romeo, R-O-M-E-O, -E first name Lois, L-O-I-S, and then the date and time of the presentation. Um, you can also get paper copies of this if you would like one by request. Thank you very much for your time, and we are done.